The holidays are here, and I thought this would be a great time to post this episode. Welcome to Walt's Kitchen Table, where I feature captivating stories from fascinating people. Today's guest, Chris of D'Amico Entertainment, lifelong singer, songwriter, has a philosophy in life he goes by called the ripple effect, and I wholeheartedly believe that we can benefit from that. Keep that in mind around the holidays and, of course, anytime. And, of course, to stay in the format of the table, we talk about a slew of other things, like uh, losing his parking spot, the fun story on how he swept his now wife off her feet, uh, some fitness and health things, of course, and we get some singing. Let's get to it. Loud and clear on here. All right, perfect. Yeah. Good. So here you are. Yeah, man. Thanks for coming. Got to oh, keep, thanks for you got to keep me. close to the mic, though. Thanks for having yeah, me. Yeah, there you go. Okay. Yeah. Uh, what's new? Man, I just saw a post about your old house. Yeah. What was that, dude? Well, I grew up in West Orange, which is not too far from right where we are. Yeah. So. Uh, How was that neighborhood? Well, was it East Orange or West Orange? West Orange. Is, West Orange is the. West Orange was the nice, it was the nice orange when I was growing <laughs> up. Um. I grew up, they, they call it up the hill, West Orange. Um, so do you, know the, do you know the history? My wife and I talk about this all the time when we drive around. Okay. So did like Orange start and then it grew and it became East Orange, West Orange? Do you know the story behind that? It, I don't. I actually, that's, that's actually a good trivia question to ask somebody. I, would, I, yeah. I don't. Um, then it's just the oranges. Right? That's it. It's the oranges. Right. Huh. And you know, and and depending upon where you grew up, everybody you know, <laughs> look yeah, yeah. you kind of look at you funny. When you say East or West Orange, depending on what that's the look you get. Well, you, you get know, um, where where I grew up in the eight, well, you know, I grew up in West Orange in the eighties, seventies, eighties. It was straight out of Steven Spielberg suburbia. Like, you know, look at the neighborhoods in E.T. and Poltergeist and stuff like that, yeah, except yeah. we weren't buried on Indian, in Indian burial grounds. <laughs> um, but the, Damn it, the, imagine the, the stories, dude. It's all about the story. <laughs> but we grew up in, like, small-town suburbia. I mean, it was a different then, too. I mean, you know, we had the arcade and we had the parks and you know we'd leave the house at nine o'clock in the morning and we'd come back in to make sure we were home for dinner and then we'd leave the house again and not come home till nine thirty at night you know yeah, it's yeah yeah uh a simpler time you know yeah you got on your bikes and and that's it and you went and knocked on the door hey can you come out and yeah. if not you, that's, you that's moved it. on hey look we're trying to get guys together to do a, a football game you know you in you, or not <laughs> <laughs> and then we didn't stop until we got like you know a five on five at least you know yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> But the thing was, there was always a five always. on five. Yeah, always. Always. Is that the kind of five. neighborhood that you had to have at least four kids to be part of the neighborhood? <laughs> well, I grew up. I I firmly believe I grew up in the epicenter. Literally, I am. I was across the street from the high school. Oh wow! The, I, if I crossed the street, I was on high school property, Whew. and I was late every goddamn day. <laughs> well, every yeah, because day. you're like, ah, I got time. It's just across the street every right? damn day. Ah. I mean, all the things that I yell at my daughter about, you know. You did the same thing. All the stuff. Was it drug-induced? No. No, I never did drugs. No? Never tried them. No? No. Um, for me, it was just, you know, I used to be the night bird. I would stay up all night, and when 7.30 in the morning would hit, you know, it would be like, oh, no. No, no, morning. Uh, morning is... And it's, I'm still the same way. I'm still a... You're not a morning guy? I am wired in the reverse <laughs> oh so we should be doing this at two o'clock in the morning oh two o'clock in the morning you probably get some of my best stuff <laughs> so just to put it in context you you uh entertainer yes dj entertainer uh musician music dj um piano player vocalist yep yep i'm gonna ask you to sing you know that right oh boy yeah sure got it you sing amazingly dude well, I always you. love to hear you sing. Thank you very much. Um, I've been doing this forever, it feels like. I, I'm probably one of the only people you'll know who knew what he wanted to do when he was five. Well, that's just, that, that was funny. That's my next question. When did you realize that you're like, I'm just going to sing for people? When I was five. I mean, it, it's all I ever wanted to do. 
I, I can't ever think of a time where I didn't want to just be a musician. That's it. I knew like in kindergarten, it said, what are you doing? I'm going to be a musician. Now, okay. Did, really? What are you going to do? No, no, seriously. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no. Yeah. What, uh, were you dreaming like being a front man to a rock and roll band? And, oh, always. You know, that kind of thing. Every, I think every guy did, Yeah. Right? Oh, shit. My, my thing was being the next Billy Joel. Okay. I wanted right. to be the next Billy Joel. Okay. Uh, my dad came home with a record from Sears in 1977. What record was that? The Stranger. The Stranger. I put it on the turntable, and that was it. From then no, on no in, No looking was, back. No huh? looking back. I was done. <laughs> I was done. I mean, from the moment moving out started to just the way you are to scenes from the Italian restaurant. She's always a woman to me. Uh, it's just amazing. Every music, song dude. was just from track one to track nine. Just a, and I was in. That's it. That was it. Now when punch my start, ticket. <laughs> yeah, right. When did you start playing the piano then? I like, started on. I was seven, and I started on a two tier. Lowry organ. That means nothing to me. Okay. Did you ever see those organs that they use at like uh, baseball games? You yeah. know, they have the layer keys here, layer keys here, pedals and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah. My neighbor had one in their house, and I would go, go over there and I would play it. And my father goes, Okay, looks like we're going to get one of these for the house. Oh, it nice. was like a piece of furniture. You know, that thing yeah, was. Yeah. And I started on one of those things. And uh, self taught? Uh, no, I had teachers come in, but I mostly played everything by ear. Um, you know, they wanted to teach me life as a cabaret and I wanted to play, you know, piano man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, and I learned how to accompany myself. So I'm like one of them raised by wolves, piano players, you know, it's yeah, like, yeah. It, uh, what a great thing. More of a, more of a taught singer, you know, mm -hmm. as I got older, uh, I, I knew where my limitations were and I knew that in order to get better, I had to find somebody that there. person to mm -hmm. take me to the next level. Uh, and I met a, a, a quirky dude, you know, his name was Jim Brown. He used to play in a, uh, in a band in the seventies and eighties called the stanky Brown group. Stanky Brown. Yeah. Group. And if you look them up, you know, they were signed. They opened up for the best of them at the, when there was a Capitol Theater down at Passaic. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, they never made it to that. They made three albums, and they never made it to that next level. Mm -hmm. But the guy knew how to write songs. The guy knew how to teach vocals. The guy knew how to, you know. So what do you do, teach, like, on the side? Yeah, well, basically out of his house, out of his attic. Huh. And I would go there. I was 19 years old, you know, and I'd go there and we learn how I'd learn how to write craft a song. Yeah, you know, that, that's talent. Um, that's... I would learn how to sing, you know, uh, how to get better at what I'm doing. You know, um, I got a great education there, better than it, it, just imagine having a one on one trade school. You know, um, and and that's really what it was. It was like they, just being in a class of one. <laughs> you know, yeah, and the guy and the guy's living the life too. He's not. He, he he. That's what he did. He produced. I mean, the guy was a producer. He was you know a record producer. Um, he did the you know I was signed to a label thing. He did the tour thing. He did you know, and when that all faded, sure. he's like, I'm going to teach other guys how to do what I did. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. you know, um. Made me a better songwriter. Made me a better singer. Um, could he take me to the next level? I don't know, you know. But then again, you get into it. You get out of it what you put into it, right? You know? Right. Um, and you know, I was one of those guys that put uh, just enough, <laughs> you know. Yeah. yeah where yeah. I should have, like now, you know, hindsight twenty twenty. Sure. I should have pushed sense. real hard, and you know. But no, I was a did, kid, you know? <laughs> yeah, did you have like a garage band and all that? Oh, yeah. I mean, <clears> you know, I started that. with bands literally not in my garage, but in my basement. Um, yeah, and yeah. my first paying professional gig was right here in Montclair. Where at? Well, it's no longer here, but it's behind the old Claridge movie theater. There's mm -hmm. a little, uh, there was a little place like a luncheonette. It was called Something Different. 
And literally during the day, it was a luncheonette, but in the back, he had a stage. Hmm. And he'd get the high school kids, give them a date. And because like back in you know the 80s, it was, there's nothing really to do. Right, so you right, tell right. everybody, listen, we're playing at something different. Yeah. Get the place would be jammed. Yeah, yeah. And he charged like $3 at the door, you know? And then Ooh, you'd bang. make the three bucks. Yeah, yeah. But the kids would buy the sodas and the sandwiches all night. Yep, so it was yep. a win, 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 win. Um, and that was my first gig. Uh, now, how big was your band? Like, and what type of music you play? It was rock and roll. Rock and roll? Yeah. Covers we, or jazz? Covers. Girls? Covers? Okay. We did everything from Sticks, Clapton, Rush. <laughs> Night Ranger. Oh, Night oh, it was Ranger. eclectic. It was so eclectic. <laughs> you know, it, it was just like a hodgepodge of like, you know, and it was great because I was the front man, you know. Now, it, would you be in the front man? You had a piano? Uh, I believe it or not, we had a keyboard player. Yeah. They wanted me to sing. And that's all you did was sing. And that's all I did was sing. Well, I was fine with that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. You know, um, I do have some of that stuff. Recorded? On a, oh, on cassette tape? Oh, wow. My God, it's got awful. <laughs> it's amazing, oh, right, though? Oh, my God, it's got awful. But it's, you know, everybody's got to start somewhere. Absolutely. I uh, I make the comment on other episodes of this. If you listen to the first two, three episodes, they're, they're fucking terrible. Of course they are. They're, they're horrible. But I, I'm like, I wouldn't expect anything less. Yeah, but I'm going to leave it up there. And it's like, no. If, just because no, when you get to episode 486, seven, you know, or something well, yeah, like that, yeah. you know, you're going to look back on like episode one and two and go, wow, listen to this. Yeah. I mean, you think Howard Stern's first show was like, well, you know. I was know? just going to say, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. that's what I just, I. Well, with a show like this, you have to find your voice. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, and then you get into a groove, and then it becomes a, a thing. A thing, you know, right? Um, and that becomes your yeah, your, your niche, your you know? niche, and your your label and your, well, your I mean, brand. It's, and it's all sort that. of kind of like what I you know what I did what I do for a living now. You know, we do a half live half DJ thing. So, uh, when did you get into that, and how did you? <laughs> it was it one of these like kicking hey. and screaming. <laughs> 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 so the way I let me show you, let me tell you this the way I. I picture it is you have a band and somebody says, Hey, my buddy's getting married and you go and you play at the wedding and you're like, Oh fuck, this is good money. And just kept playing at weddings. Um, all right. You're half right. Okay. <laughs> you know, it was one of those things where, like I said, I grew up in West orange in that house that you saw mm -hmm, mm -hmm. had the band in the house. You know, we the were basement. That, that basement, you know, band. <laughs> we'd go out, we'd do our cover gigs. And with the money from the cover gigs, we would record our originals. And, and we would try to... Well, build you know, something. Quote, unquote, sure. make it, dude. You know? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and, yeah. and try to build something. What and was the it, name of the band? Uh, well, it depends on what you... I had Speak Softly. Then I had Mr. Blue. Then I had um, Chakra. Chakra. Mm -hmm. And uh, the last one I had was Days of Rain, D-A-Z-E, Rain, of Rain. Which, by the way, that album is still up on Spotify. No you shit. You can find that album days on of Spotify. Rain. Days of Rain. Days of Rain. But days like... D-A-Z-E, like, like I'm in a days. <laughs> um, and I, out of all the albums that I did, as far as like you know, trying to make it, dude, the Days of Rain album is the one I'm pretty much the most proud of. Okay. Um, even though I'm recording... You know what? You can't... You've always got to try to get better. Oh, you know, absolutely. The stuff I'm doing now is 100 times better than what I was doing 10 years ago than I was doing 10 years before that. So, you know. Well, it's better than you did well, probably I'm, last year too, the, right? The, the only thing is, is I'm, I'm sorry we can't grow in the reverse. You know? Grow in the reverse. You, you, what I mean by that is it's like, you know, I'm going to be the big 5-0 next year. Congratulations. Yeah, I'm going to hopefully I'll get the finish line. Um, <laughs> but uh, the thing is, is, I am probably singing and performing the best that I have ever sang and performed before in my life in a time where I'm pretty much irrelevant in the real business. Yeah, but the thing is, though, do you... The first thing that popped in my mind was because where you're at in life, the experiences you've had in life, mm -hmm. how you handle life now, right? Now... A quick story, yeah, and it'll it'll make sense. My buddy and I used to ride around all around Colorado on motorcycles and bar hop and do all that shit, right? 
I like blues music, right? And he goes, hey, there's this, uh, what do you call it when somebody's real young and they're uh, like really good? What's the word for that? Prodigy? Prodigy, thank you. Uh, like a 15-year-old prodigy mm-hmm. with, jet, you know, guitar. And we're like, well, let's go check him out. And he's playing. He's really good, right? But I'm like, eh, he's not as good as the dude that has been doing it for 30 years, got a gravelly voice, life gave him experience, his heart's been... I can say what I want on this podcast, right? Absolutely, you can say anything you want. Yeah, life hasn't fucked him yet. (laughs) No, no, that's what I'm... No, absolutely. No, absolutely. He hasn't had those experiences. That's why like, when we go through like June and like the kids are graduating high school, I'm like... Well, congratulations on graduating the easiest part of your friggin' uh, life. Now, yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. And uh, we have a mutual friend. I won't mention his name, but he was when I first met him, I moved out here, first met him young. We were all out drinking and stuff. And all of us were like, I'll take the cheapest cigar, the house cigar, and I'll just take a, a Coors Light. He's like, no, I want this expensive cigar, and I want your top shelf whiskey, and this, that, and the other. And he goes, I only do the top shelf stuff all the time. And I'm like, yeah, motherfucker, wait till life throws a rope around your ankles and drags oh, you down the street a little bit. You know, and I went on about that and like bounce you over curbs, you know, which is great. That's what makes us who we are, right? Good, bad, but, or indifferent, though, you are where you're supposed to be. Absolutely. Couldn't agree with you more. That's, and I learned that lesson. The hard way, you know. Mm-hmm. I mean, good, bad, or indifferent, you are where you're supposed to be. Yep. Um, it doesn't make sense, you know. Well, um, yeah, but you go fucking nuts if you try to figure it out. No. Just uh, go with it. it. It just, you know, that's, I mean, that's one of the biggest problems that I have is, you know, I'm always trying to, you know, go to life rather than have life come to me. <laughs> you know what I yeah, mean? Yeah, yeah. Um, overthinking does nothing but give you aggravation and sadness, so, you know. Well, I think it's, I use the phrase, I inject like stress and overthinking in different words. It's like overthinking is like sitting in a rocking chair. You go back and forth, but you don't go anywhere. Nope. So what the fuck, dude? Well, isn't it Mark Twain? I think he <clears throat> said, you know, um, all the things that I worried about, uh, you know, it would have been better if they all came true. <laughs> you know, yeah. something, so I can't, I'm, I'm misquoting him, but it's it's like one of those statements. It's yeah, like, yeah. you know. But then the, the you biggest know, you, problems of my life were the ones that I had in my head that never really happened. Oh, I do know. I do know that quote. I need to <laughs> yeah. look that up. I'll post it later. Yeah, I'll look it up. And it's, post it. it's. I found that pretty profound. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I was telling somebody though, I was a lot happier with a lot less. Well, less is more. Yeah, you know what? And it's it's true for music. <laughs> you know, it's where you don't play. It's in the spaces that make it. You wow. Know, what sounds so. Uh, are you talking like how you pause and w- explain that? I think and, I get it, but... You know, if you're going to listen to a good piece of music, uh, and I'll pick on a hell of a band, Steely Dan. You know, I'll pick on a band like Steely Dan. Um, if you put on a pair of headphones, you know, y- you can hear everybody have their moment, you know? You can hear the bass line, and it's not stepping on the guitar line, and it's not stepping on the saxophone's dick, and it's not stepping on the vocals, and it's not stepping. Everybody's got their space to do what they have to do, and when it all comes together, it makes a beautiful piece of music. It's like, you know, when the singer's trying to sing, and the guitar player's doing like, behind them, you know, it's just, just you can't embrace a piece of music, you know, oh. it's it's in the spaces that give it what it is you know that's awesome dude that's well i that's awesome that's you know that's good music to me i mean that's good life you know it's just you so remember what i just said before we started this thing you know i have a business it's 24 7 365 and i live in the spaces spaces. between yeah yeah (laughs) and i think that nowadays okay going back to what you're saying easier time when you run around on your bicycle and all that right but now you can look at quantity and quality, right? You know, my family, we're all crazy busy, right? But when we're together, it's the quality, right? Yeah, that's so what it's... if I get four hours with my wife uninterrupted, oh, it's amazing. Of course. Yeah. Uh, but that's, you know, 
I mean, we, you and I are going to touch on about 100 subjects with this. We can go into different branches of this sucker. Um, <laughs> it's one of the things where, you know, I don't know if you listen to Zach Brown band. I f oh, dude, we love Zach Brown. Okay. We'll live out in our old band somewhere around on the sand, just me and you. You know, um, you know my history, of course, you know, with my son and, mm -hmm. and everything, you know, and out there in podcast land, I had a son uh, who passed away four years ago in, in a boating accident. But before he passed away, the year before he passed away, um, I was going crazy with different bills, different responsibilities, the kids running in 18 different directions, the just the, the rhythm of life in general in Northeast America, which I believe is probably the fastest paced area Absolutely. ever. Absolutely. Um, Unless it, you go to Vermont. Yeah. <laughs> oh. And the thing here is, you know, it's just so fast paced and it's so stressful. And I just remember saying to my wife, I said, you know, before there was an all of this, there was just a you and me. Oh. You know what I mean? And it's funny because social media has even made it worse. And what I mean by that is it's, you know, we have doing what I do for a living, doing what you did, you know, all the years with the photography and the, yep. the networking that you've done, the people that you've met yep. throughout yep. the course of your life. <clears throat> we get to meet all kinds of kinds. Oh, and we, the spectrum. And we get to, to know a lot of people. You know, my wife calls me the mayor. I mean, you oh, know. So now anywhere you go. Oh, we, we were in Hawaii on our honeymoon. And <laughs> I'm online at like six o'clock in the morning to go to the Pearl Harbor exhibit. And somebody goes, hey, oh, D'Amico, do, was... do you want do you want coffee? My wife goes, really? In Hawaii, someone knows you. We were oh. all the way up at Gore Mountain one time. And uh, I knew Where's the Gore Mountain? Gore Mountain is all the way up in the... Uh, over by like uh, where Lake Placid is, like oh, okay. all the way upstate New York, and we're at a lodge, and the band is playing, and somebody in the band goes, "Domico, you want to come up and sing?" You're like, and I knew the guy in the band, and I get up and I sing a song with the band, and from the far, far, far end of the lodge, a girl's voice goes, "That's not Chris Domico, is it?" <laughs> <laughs> and my wife goes, "Are you kidding me?" Oh, that but is... we know we, we it just because of what we do yeah. we're always pressing the flesh and meeting new people and stuff like that but when you have friends and you go online that's what i mean by social media you're on facebook and imagine being like 25 today on facebook and you're still living in your parents basement and you log on and you see that one of the kids that you went to high school with just landed a job for two hundred fifty thousand dollars a year and then this other friend got married and then this other friend is getting ready to buy a huge house and this other friend is getting ready to have their kid and then here you are with no job living in your mother's basement, basement. screaming at her for a hot pocket and, and yeah the ma the meatloaf you know, <laughs> yeah, and, yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you know you feel like you're so far behind because nobody posts their failures on no, social absolutely. media you know i say i say social media is a highlight reel yeah it's it's a blimp of what I mean, they do during I've kind of used it um, to be cathartic. Um, you know, I put myself out there, warts and all. Yeah, yeah. That's yep, you, you know, that's how I use the social media. Mm -hmm. But from you know, some people they're sitting there and they're, I'm so far behind. No, you're not far behind. You you know everybody peaks when they peak. You know, yeah, absolutely. Um, but you, well, how do you know that's even real? What they're posting? Yeah, but you get out of life what you put into it too. I mean, if you're sitting in your mom's basement smoking pot and wondering why you're not getting anywhere, eh, you need to look at that too. You know, it's right. like the Animal House. You know, fat, drunk, and stupid is no way to go through life, son. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Damn, quoting Animal House. <laughs> you know, that's a classic. Um, and believe it or not. I mean, that's what happened to me. I mean, you know, I was still living at home. I was 19 years old, um, 20. I just I got into a car accident with my girlfriend. Um, 
I had a 1978 Cadillac run into my 1985 Camaro. Ooh. So when boat that, pe- meets fiberglass, yeah, um, yeah. And I was going to say, he totally wrecked my car. So I had no car. I had my girlfriend. I wasn't going to school. I didn't have a job. You know, but you I were a front man. I was, yeah, I was a pseudo rock star. <laughs> I'm going to make it, man. Yeah. You know, and I'm laying in bed in, in my room watching TV, and they're talking about the Gulf War, you know, that, yeah, the original yeah. Gulf War, original, right? you know, yeah. Desert Storm. Yep. And they're talking about maybe we might have to reissue the draft. And you went, shit. That's exactly what I did. I shit my pants. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm like, and then that was the moment where I was like, what the fuck am I doing with my life? You know? Hmm. Um, now imagine being me in social media days. And all oh, your friends you are excelling. And then you're just sitting there, no car. Nothing. Nothing. No you prospects. know, no job, no prospects, no nothing, no band. Yeah. And, you know, it, it just exacerbates it. Here's my 50 cent SAT word of the day. And it makes you... <laughs> can in, you spell it? In, 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 no. <laughs> um, can you use it in a sentence? No. Uh, can, um, it, it just makes it hard, harder for kids today um, because they just feel like they're behind the eight ball. Yeah. And then they get everything. I get the job. I get the baby. I get the house. I get the wife. I get the cars. I get, it's still not enough. And then you sit back and you go... And then you get the bill. And then you yeah, yeah. sit back and you go, shit, this was a lot better when I was living in my mother's basement. And I did the same thing. You yeah, know, I went yeah. and I got out and I got the business and I got the... the now, did you start the entertainment business right away? Or I did got you thrown... St- well, you know what? Let's go back around to you. Ask me how the hell I got into this thing. Let yeah, me finish yeah. that question for you. Um, I was playing rock and roll and I was trying to make it. And, you know, you get to a point where in your, like, late 20s, um, I was with my wife, then girlfriend, Mm -hmm. from the time I was 23. And I was about 29, getting ready to be 30. And I'm like, yeah, this, this, you know, I've come real close. I've worked with, you know, record labels and did this and got Mm -hmm. albums released and fun stuff like that. But they just, you know, died in crib death. Um, And you just like, you get done fighting. And then you have to make a decision. And then, you know, I'm going to get married. You know, I want to have a family. Uh, And, you know, my priorities changed. Mm -hmm. And it was one of those things where it's like, well, I still want to be a musician for a living. Um, the bars and clubs, thanks to uh, 9-11, um, I think that was the start of it. Um, and then you what, know, social media just kicked it back. In. Uh, well, actually, what do, you, what do you mean by the bars and clubs with 9-11? Um, all right. So if you go back to 2000, you had Great White in Rhode Island have an accident on stage where oh, the burned everybody is that the where burnt everybody down yep 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 so the that was great white that was great white okay i forgot about that oh i knew about the accident i forgot it was great white which automatically sent shockwaves through the insurance industry oh. for bars and clubs to carry bands so <laughs> jack it up jack it up, up their prices and stuff um so that happened and then, you know, one of the biggest scenes was Hoboken. Hmm. And then 9-11 happened. Close that down. And it kind of turned, you know, it was kind of morbid. Mm-hmm. You know, this whole area was like sunken for like, you know, years after that. I lived in Clifton at the time. I watched those towers come down from the roof of my house. Yeah, and, my best friend was in New York City when all that happened. Yeah, and it just, you could feel the change. You know, at one point, you can make a good living playing bars and clubs. Right, and that changed? And it did, you know. Um, it, it was, it, you, could, you could just sense. And at the time, I was starting this, I called up a DJ company, and I said, I got this concept I want to run by you. And the guy, you know, I knew the guy, and he's like, 
Oh, what do you got? I said, I got a hybrid thing I want to do. And this was back in 99, 2000. Okay. When you can kind of sense, like, you know, everything was changing. Mm -hmm. and, and he's like, all right, well, I'll fund it. You sell it. Hmm. And I was like, okay. And, you know, I kind of created the process, the, the presentation of it all. Right, right. And he, he backed it. Now, did you target weddings or did it, you just... It was made for weddings. Okay, okay. Um, it was made for people, you know, the way I designed it, it was made by addition, by subtraction. What do you hate about wedding bands and wedding DJs? Oh, I see, I see. And, you oh, know... excuse me just one second. Hey, Val. Yeah. Here. I need you. That's her mom. Your oh. mom's calling me. Oh, thank you. Can you... Say hi to mom. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um... And uh, wedding bands and wedding DJs, you know, there are things that people didn't like about them. You know, uh, the wedding bands, you know, only know what they know. Um, you know, and oh, what they have a limited playlist. Well, let's right? put it this way: every band has their ten best, their next ten best. Please make it stop for the love of God. After, why, uh, why did you even try that? Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah, and so yeah. forth. Down. Um, well, you hope that people are drinking throughout it. Well, and yeah, but still, you know, they're only, you know, they have their strengths and they have their weaknesses. Yep. You know, um, and then the wedding DJs, you know, most wedding DJs in the 90s, there was a lot of fist pumping guidos going on. You know what I'm oh, saying? Okay. Like, okay. And, and hats, lays, sunglasses, and tchotchkes, and chicken dances, and YMCA's. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, so my whole thing was based upon what if you can have all the elegance of live music, but the, the people who are performing are only going to perform the best at what they per perform. And then mix in the DJ with And it. then basically, but we have all the flexibility of a DJ. So like you would, you would have like a live, I'm just going off what you sure. kind of do now, right? Is maybe the first dance you sing it live, you perform it live, but then later on, it's the top 40 music is pumping through the DJ. Pretty much. I mean, you know, we do usually first dance, parent dances via DJ. Um, you know, mainly just to get the people through the pomp and circumstance. They don't <laughs> want to be in the spotlight any longer than they have to be. But what we do is we interject live in the dance sets. The, we're not a band per se. It's one of those things where we make tracks. Like I have a track for Just the Way You Are by Billy Joel. Okay. The piano part's removed. The saxophone parts removed. Oh, okay. Of course, okay. the vocals removed. Sure, sure. And we just superimpose those parts over the top. And you. And but you, what happens is the song before it might be Elvis can't help falling in love with you. Right. And it'll mix right into us doing sure, just the way sure. you are live, out of it into something else. Oh, okay. So the foundation of the show is DJ. Um. And but we're mixing in live, and we never tell the room. You know, ladies and gentlemen, me. We just you know just do it, do it, and you, you get the. You know, wow. Oh, that guy's singing. Yeah. Wait a minute. That's and, a guy singing. That's, you know, that's called entertainment, you know, and that's what we're <laughs> providing. Right, right. Um, and, you know, the show took off. And what happened was the owner of the company that I was working with sold the company. And the guy who took the company over was a kid who really okay. shouldn't have taken over. Didn't know what's going on. Yeah. True. I mean, the kid was a good kid. Lack of experience. That's all it came down to. Yep. You know, just expect things to keep running without rolling up your sleeves, you know? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he was destroying the business. And I kind of just kind of splintered off on my own, you know, and been doing it ever since, like 2007, you know? So what's that, uh, 20? Oh, no. Jesus. What's my math? Yeah, uh, 20 it's almost, years? It's almost 13 years. Well, if you no. go all the way back to, yeah, I'm 21 years. Yeah, yeah doing it doing this um but it was born out of well it looks like i'm not going to be the next billy joel but i still need to pay the mortgage and keep the refrigerator full and i don't want to do it you know um swinging a hammer you know that's not yeah, me sure, sure i don't want to do it driving a u-haul truck that's not me you know what <laughs> yeah, i mean that's yeah. not me you know right, i'm yeah. a i'm a musician that's what i you know always wanted to be and you know be careful what you wish for um <laughs> And, you know, I mean, there's a lot of things I love about the business, and there's a lot of things I just can't stand about the business. Well, the thing, though, is the, the pros outweigh the cons, obviously. Yeah. Um, right? But the cons seem bigger when they're some going days. on. Yeah. Some days. You know yeah. um, you know what it is? I, I always 
liken myself to a uh, a baseball player. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm in the the busiest part of my season right now. Sure, as you yeah. know, oh, I'm yeah, in October. Absolutely. Okay, and you're in the busiest state yes. area. Yeah, uh, Northern New Jersey is you know New York area is one mm-hmm. of the biggest. Um, but whenever I get to this point of the year, I'm like that baseball player who's like, maybe this is the year that I'm going to retire after this season is over. Oh, okay. And, you know, okay. then it slows. Yeah, yeah. Then then they're off. Like, you know, I'm not off, but like I slow down November, December. And then you're January. like, it's not bad. I and then like February, it. they're like, I'll come back for one more season. <laughs> you know, <laughs> When we get to this point of the year, it's like, oh, my God. Yeah, yeah. It's a grind. It's a grind. Absolutely. And Absolutely. like I said to you earlier, you know, it's it's – phone calls and emails and bears oh my and it's just you're 24 7 365 and you're living your life in the spaces between yeah 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 that's really what this business is you know and any good business owner is kind of like that you know i guess yeah. well you have to, well especially in your side of the business because i was in that as well yeah you're dealing with customers after they're off of work so you're not first of all you're not working regular business hours no because your customers are working at that time they're not calling you they want to talk to you at eight o'clock at night exactly you know and saturday afternoon and come visit you at saturday afternoon to do all that well my my whole theory on when they want to visit me in on the weekend is if i can meet you on the weekends you don't want to hire me in the first place yeah but that's a very point <laughs> Okay, yeah, if because I, if I ain't got nothing going on in the weekend. Monday through Thursday is the sales office. Yeah, Friday, where we Saturday. sell the product. Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, Sunday we deliver the product. Yeah, yeah. And you know there is no there's no days off. There's oh look, I happen to have a Saturday here, you know. And then you're not really off because then if you have a family, it's like you're planning something because you don't normally have the time. Yeah, yeah, off. absolutely. Yeah, you yeah. know, there's never we're gonna sit at home. <sighs> oh. Yeah, it's just not. No, at ten o'clock at night, my wife and I do that for like half an hour, and then I'll fall asleep, and I'll kind of wake up and I'll look over, and she's sleeping, and the TV's going, and well, my wife like, and I, I time for bed. <laughs> we're on reverse schedules, you know. She's like nine thirty out, out, and I'm like, you know, I'm ready for dinner at a wedding. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because that's about when you get fed, right? But that's yeah. what uh, I mean. I guess that's what makes it work between the two of us, you know. Well, my parents celebrated 62 years. And they never had a fight. No. That she didn't win. No. (laughs) They fought all the time. Not all the time. But, you know, they had a marriage. But my dad worked. My dad left at 4 o'clock in the morning, got home at like 6 o'clock at night. My mom worked from 11 to 7 at night. So they were on reverse schedules. No, I can't so for imagine. 30 years, they didn't really see each other. They just right? slapped each other five. Yeah, on the way out. Yeah. Boop. Good they, game. They had, a, they had what I call hallway <laughs> sex. Yeah, yeah. They walk by each other in the hallway and go, fuck, fuck you. you. <laughs> yeah, fuck you too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> go fuck yourself. I just yeah. did. Now it's fuck your turn. Fuck you. Fuck you too. <laughs> uh. Yeah, but you love it though, don't you? Yeah. You love singing, huh? I do. I got into. I didn't get into it to type emails and deal with crazy yeah. brides. And I, I wanted to just sing my songs. I had one guy tell me in the business, he's had worse experience with grooms than brides. He calls them groomzillas. And there are a couple out there. Um, you know, I like to consider myself the bride whisperer at this point. That's awesome. I am, great, I've never heard that, but that's <laughs> fucking great, dude. <laughs> Because I spent all those years dealing doing the same thing. Well, yeah. you know what it is? It's, um, I had a shift in perspective after my son passed away. Mm. Uh-huh. And it's like, all right. Well, first of all, I had to ask myself, do you want to continue to do this? Yeah. And because really it consumes your life. You know, um, two days after he passed away, I was doing a wedding. Ooh. That weekend, I did the wedding. I did the wedding Friday. I did a wedding Saturday. Sunday was the wake. Oh, um, dude! And it was it. Well, you know what it was like. It's like what they say when you get into a car accident. They say get back in a car and drive. Yeah, I well, say that with motorcycles. It's something like I, that. Yeah, motorcycles. Yeah. Any type of, like vehicle accident. Yeah. Um, oh, you think if you stayed away for a week or so, you'd been like, "Fuck it, I'm done." Uh, I was afraid of that. 
Yeah, yeah. I was certainly afraid of that. You yeah. know, if I, um, the funny thing is, I'm still that kid laying in my bed in my mom's house watching TV. Right. Except, you know, I force myself to be a responsible adult. <laughs> well, I think, yeah, I think a lot of people do that. Okay. Right? And it's like, I got to get up and handle my shit. And that's really what it comes down to is like, I can easily get into a fetal position and suck my thumb for the rest of my yeah, life, yeah, <laughs> you know? Yeah. It would be that easy to fall back into that kind of yeah, role. But, then now, but now look at who you got dependent on you. Well, and that's right? part of the reason why I pushed too, you know? Mm -hmm. The other thing too is I think I was just in such pure shock. Um, well, but, yeah, not like it, I mean, yeah. But the shift in perspective was, okay, if I am going to continue to do this, I'm going to do it on my terms. So... You know, I go into client meetings, potential client meetings, with the uh, mindset of the interview goes both ways. Oh, absolutely. If sure. I think you're going to be a pain in my ass oh. for the 10 to 12 months that you're going to be my client until I do your event, See there's you. another one who looks just like you'll come right in after. And if there's not, I'll get that night off. Yeah. You, yeah. you know? No, great um, attitude, though. Cause it's... It's, no, it's not like when you first started. I'm gonna I'm gonna assume this, and you can correct me. Is when you first start, I don't care how big of a bitch you're gonna be. The check's clearing because I need I need to fill my refrigerator. Absolutely right. And then you get to the point. It's like no, it's a two way street. You got to be happy with whatever you're doing. Absolutely. You know, my father. This is another topic we can. Again, these branches. Yeah, I love it, dude. That's um, why I do this. Yeah. That's why it's totally like, you're like, what do you want to talk about? Fuck, I don't know, dude. Let's just start talking. My father said to me at 17, he, he uh, left my mom. Um, and like I said, we can go on to 100 topics of this. Um, one of the topics that I like to talk about, you know, especially with the house, you know, the, the, that post I just made with the house. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when you're... When you look at your parents, you don't, or teachers, when you were in high school, you don't look at them like guys and girls. They're like, that's mom and dad. And they have friends. There's, they they're, have they're my teachers. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So when you know you go out somewhere and your teacher's having a beer somewhere, you're like. What the? <laughs> Your mind is fucking blown. <laughs> right. And it's not, you know, it's because. Well, you put them in a. You're human. Right, <laughs> you know? right, right. Yeah. You know, you put them on, a, on, a, on such a pedestal. Mm -hmm. But really what a mom and a dad are is just another guy and another girl trying to fucking figure it out like yeah. the rest no, of us. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, and I said there are no adults. There are only older children winging it. Well, what's the what's the <laughs> meme I saw? Being a, I didn't know being an adult was just googling shit, and my back hurts all the time. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> just well, well, I always tell people out. all the time, my back goes out more than I do. <laughs> um, but you know, when my dad left my mom, I was seventeen, and I mean, I never met two people who did not belong together more than my mom and dad. Okay, just wasn't working. No, like oil and water. I Are think you the only only from them? Yes. Oh, my okay. mother was married before and had two children. Okay. My father has since married after my mother, and I have another sister. Oh, so okay. I got a lot of halves, no holes. Okay. And, um, but because of the age difference between everybody, I was basically an only child. Um, but my dad said something to me at 17 that I didn't fully understand until I was 24, which relates to what we were just talking about. He said, Chris, you're given one life. And if you can't go through it happy, what the hell's the sense of going through it? Yeah. He goes, and your mom was not making me happy. Oh, my God. It goes, I had a guest on not too long ago last week. And uh, she's like, yeah, I just split up with my boyfriend in like four years or something. I'm like, congratulations. And she's like, I'm so happy you said that because most people are like, oh, I'm sorry. No, obviously it's not fucking working. You're not happy. No. You should move on. And, and that's the thing. It's like, you, you know... Nothing in life should be forced. No, absolutely not. 
because it's physics, man. You look at the laws of physics. Well, what you resist, persists, force, right? force equals resistance. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> the amount of force is the amount of resistance that comes back. Yeah, and well, that's the and you get what you put out, right? Yeah. If you're just a good dude, you put good shit out. Good shit comes back to you. Yeah. Well, you would hope. You know, yeah. you, you give a little love, and a love comes back to you, Bugsy yep. Malone. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> and you know, I didn't get it at 17 because it was like you know. I was 17. Yeah. Fuck you, your dad. You should be with mom, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I got to be in a, you know, I, I don't want to say an adult because I don't even still, look, I'm a musician for a living. You can't be <laughs> a grown up and a musician at the same time. They say that about comedians, too. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, but, you know, as I got older and I understood a little more, I'm like, you know what? He was fucking right. You know? Yeah, but you probably went through a relationship or two and got bounced around and you're like, you know what? I feel so much better. I'm not with that person. You know, when I met my wife, the funny story about meeting my wife is we met at a bar and we both did not want to be in the bar that night. Ah, uh, were you working? No. Oh, okay. I was home. Yeah, I was 20, 20, almost 23. I was home playing Nintendo. Um, my ex-girlfriend earlier that year had relieved me of the relationship. <laughs> well, the honest answer is, um, I did not have the amount of dicks required to fill her need. <laughs> wow, dude, that is, <laughs> that is, <laughs> um, pr pretty much that was the problem it with her. It wasn't I didn't the size, have, it was the amount. It, it, it was... <laughs> I did not have, you know, I, I must have this many dicks to ride this ride. And yeah, yeah. she, I did not really have the required amount of dicks, which were required to satisfy her, apparently. But, um, wow. she, how old were you with that one? I was, when she broke up with me, I was 21. Um, and, uh, you know, it devastated me. And I think it devastated me more for the fact of when you break up with somebody when you're that young. You just don't think you're gonna ever get laid again. You're never gonna oh, have anybody. Oh, you're yeah, you're oh, never gonna find anybody. You're done. done. It's Might over. Well it yeah. Yeah. My parking spot is gone. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's, Dude, it's. I like that one. Just, you know, and oh wait a minute, that's gonna be the name of the episode. <laughs> My parking spot's gone. Hold on, I gotta write that down. <laughs> but really, it's 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 what it is. It's like. When you're that young, you're like, holy shit, I'm never getting laid again. I'm never going to find anybody again. My life is over. Yeah, Woe of is me. Yeah, yeah. And, and she was probably smoking hot. And you're like, I'm she never going to. She was pretty. Um, but she was as equally as fucking crazy. And um, <laughs> yeah, but I, you know, the crazier they are, the better the sex. Well, right? you know what they say, though? They say, like, no matter how hot she is, there is always somebody yeah. out there sick of her shit. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I was definitely sick of her shit. Yeah. Um, and. I'm sitting at home. I had no intention of going out. I'm playing Nintendo baseball. And my friend Mark comes over. Actually, he calls. You know, this is when they actually would call a phone and you would pick up the phone and You'd have a conversation. You have to get off the couch, You'd walk over to, to the wall. No, I actually had a phone had a that had a long enough cable oh, like that oh, okay. sat on the bed with me. And I picked up the phone and he goes, come on, we're going out. And I went, fuck that. And yeah, he's yeah. like, oh, we're going out. And I'm like, no. And I hung up on him. And then he, he's next thing you know, he's at my house. Yeah, he's yeah. like, come on, we're going out. No. He's in my closet picking out an outfit. Oh, we're going out. A... Come on. You look good in this. Let's go. Fuck me. All right. We go out. And now we're out. And I'm in one of the noisiest, craziest bars in North Arlington at the time called Fatso Fogarty's. Fatso what? Fogarty's. Fogarty's. It was, th that bar was out of control. Um, and there's this cute little blonde standing there. And we're having just, you know, I don't want to be here. I don't want to be here either. What are you here? My friend dragged me out. What are you here? My friend dragged me out. Let's go to Denny's. Chat, 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 chat. Exchange business. You know, I gave her a business card because, you know, in the 90s, it's like. Oh, you're slick with a business oh, card. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Wow. I'm you're a musician. My name is Chris. I do cocktail hours and stuff for weddings <laughs> as well as play. D like I was fucking right. <laughs> <laughs> And what she was doing, she was playing business card bingo. Um, was she going around collecting them? What she was doing was she would, yeah, meet guys, get their business cards, and go out and have a free meal. 
God, well, that, take you that, out for a date. She was, she was a, she still. I mean, still is. I'm hoping to God. I mean, after twenty something years, but she was, <laughs> you know, she was a good girl. She wouldn't like you know go on business, you know, go out to dinner and have sex. She was just like go out to dinner, thanks, and go. <laughs> go on, <laughs> and, see ya. Good night. Thanks ah. for the dinner. Bye bye. Oh wow. And even our first date was a lunch date. Okay. We went to the TikTok diner. Oh, classic. Dude. Oh, cla look, uh, I was all class back then. Yeah. Um, and I had a convertible Chrysler Baron convertible. Chrysler LeBaron. Uh, Chrysler LeBaron. LeBaron. Yeah, yeah. The, yeah, yeah. What I've, a piece of shit that car was. I rented them a couple times. And, you know, I'm in the convertible. We, it's a beautiful, it's early, late July, early August. I take her out. We have lunch. And then I drive her down by like, you know, um, we hawk in overlooking the city and everything like that. Classy. Dude. Oh, You're dude. You're all full I'm, class I'm, here. Dude, I'm all Top about Top down? It. Yeah. <laughs> and we go back to her house, and uh, she lives around a corner. She lived in Belleville, and she lives around a corner from Jackie's Lemon Ice. We got a, we got a Jackie's Lemon Ice, and then she had E.T. on video cassette. now that I'm dating myself. And we sat... She so you went back to her house and watched it? She lived in an apartment above her grandmother. She watched her grandmother who had dementia. Oh, okay. And the deal was, I'm watching grandma, and I get to stay in the apartment upstairs. Yeah, yeah, well. Yeah. And, you know... And um, me hawking. I, let me tell you something. I give my wife all the credit in the world watching that old lady. She was a lot of work. Yeah. And my wife was only 21. Ooh. You know? And, God bless her. Oh, God. God bless her is right. And, you know, we're watching E.T. And she goes, I got to go down and fold some laundry. You know, they'll switch laundry for my grandma. I was like, all right. And, you know, when I'm watching TV in her place. And she comes back up like about 15, 20 minutes later. And, you know, and we're hanging out. We hung out all night. And uh, I come to find out later on, you know, first of all, she told her mother, that's the man I marry. That night? That night. No shit. No shit. I didn't uh, know. I didn't know this, but she said well, that to course. her mother. She said, "That's the man yeah, I'm She's married. got dementia. She... And it's well, not her. Her grandmother. Oh, grandmother. But, sorry. Yeah. And uh, I found out that she, when she went downstairs to fold laundry, she actually canceled the date that she was supposed to go on that night for dinner. <laughs> <laughs> quote, quote unquote. Yep. Uh, quote laundry. Mm -hmm. Nice, and, dude. We've been together ever since, and that was August of 93. Damn, dude, I graduated high school in 93. Isn't that crazy? I graduated so in 89. That uh, uh, picture on Facebook, with, it's her on the piano, right? Yeah. All right. That's, that's a 18 cool years ago that's this past cool, Monday. No shit. That's yeah. a cool picture, dude. We got married one month Was after, that your wedding? Yeah. Okay. We got married one month after 9-11. Where'd you get married? Mayfair Farms. Oh, oh, that's nice. And that picture was taken at the restaurant that you, where the CVS is at the top of the, the hill is in West Orange. The big CVS at the yeah, top yeah, of Eagle Rock. Yeah. There used to be a place called Pal's Cabin. And oh, that, no shit. That huh? restaurant was there for 82 years. Oh. Um, and the, I used to be a waiter and a manager and everything at the place. No way. Yeah. yeah. And the, the same family owned Mayfair Farms. Oh, okay. And that piano Liberace played. No, that's awesome, dude. And Liberace got his start at Pal's Cabin all like 100 years ago yeah, at this yeah, point. Yeah, yeah. And uh, that's that piano. So we made sure that that picture was taken because it just, oh, you know, cool. Fit. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And Is that still around? Do they still have that piano? Yeah, it's actually now at Mayfair Farms. Is it? Oh, okay, yeah. cool. And uh, now, remember, we're a month removed from 9-11, mm -hmm. and we have to get on a 10-hour plane ride to Hawaii. Oh, Maui or Hawaii? Ma uh, we went to uh, Waikiki first. Okay. And it was funny as hell because it was like, great, now I got to get man, on a plane. Man, <laughs> you just get strip shirts and well, everything back, else. Well, back then, we still weren't sure what was happening. Yeah, yeah. Because then yeah. the anthrax thing came out right yeah, after that, so yeah. we didn't know how else they were attacking us. You know, right. very scary time. And then what's that? Like a ten-hour flight, right? Yeah. Uh, 
I could never do that today. It's amazing. I was like 31 years old going, yeah, 10 hour flight, we'll watch the movies, we'll do this good. And I dealt with it. But even then, it was like after seven hours, it was like, get me just off get of this friggin' plane. I do whatever I can. To, now I just overdose on CBD oil, so it fucking shuts me down. And I tell, and I, you know, we talk now. If we ever go back to Hawaii, we're gonna stop in San Francisco. Yeah, and well, spend a couple of days there, and then, then go, go. Yeah. Well, I flew. I spent a lot of time in Maui uh, in my first marriage, and I lived in Colorado. And we would stop in San Francisco, or not San, uh, San Diego. I think. Anyway, that was the, we didn't go straight even from Colorado. We would stop over in, uh, you know, LA, depending on how the flights were. Yeah. Right? But even from that short a distance, it fucking, it was amazing because we took a one nonstop one time in coach from Colorado. Oh, and my I was God. Like, no, no. You know, we're big guys, dude. I can't fit in a, I just don't fit in a coach seat comfortably. Last first. year, last year. Literally almost a year to the date was the first time I ever flew first class someplace. No shit. Business is good, huh? And I will never not fly first class <laughs> ever again. Now, see, where I, the big difference for me is business class. Business class I can deal with. That's nice because the leg room and the your little seats are a little different and all that. I've never flown first class. I visit my brother once a year. Down in Boca Raton. Okay. Every year I go. And if anything, on a plane, I'll get the first seat. I, first guy out. Only because I just want to grab, because I never, like, throw the bags on the carousel. I throw, I have my carry-on and my one piece. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I get up, grab them both, door opens, I'm uh, out. And you don't have to worry about, like, Cramping there's, somebody sitting on top of you. Oh, dude, there's two huge fucking pet peeves I have about flying. When you're boarding, everybody crowds the gate. And you're like, dude, the plane's not, you got a seat. The plane's not fucking going anywhere. Nope. And then somebody told me, which makes total sense, everybody crowds to try to get on first because they bring so much luggage because they don't want to pay for it. They bring it on and try to stuff it on the plane and take up all the room. Well, the beauty of it, the, the first seat, too, is I'm usually, you know, the first one in because I'm also in, like, you know, zone one. Yeah, 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 you know, yeah. Um, they watch everybody go by you? Well, you know what? A couple of years ago, I just decided that, you know, life's too short for shit. Um, I want to go see some things. Yeah. So I went to Chicago last year. Mm -hmm. Um Part business, part pleasure, but I wanted to see a Cubs game. Um, I wanted to, see, you know, see Wrigley Field, see the Sears Tower, go up top, you know. Um, so I got my known traveler number now. So oh, I go okay. through T TSA. Um, I went to Nashville. Never been to Nashville. I figure you'd love it down there. Are huh? you kidding me? Yeah, never been there. My wife's never been there well, either, so we're going to. Well. Do yourself a favor. Just book a ticket. Tomorrow. Yeah, I heard Nashville's just Tomorrow. incredible. Yesterday. Yeah, yeah. It's not even Nashville. It's Tennessee. Yeah. yeah I'm going to yeah. tell you a funny story. A uh, funny sort of, <laughs> you know. Back in 2009, the guy with the big house and the big family and the big business and the... Big bills to match. Sure. Was having a little bit of a breakdown <laughs> because okay. of busting my ass, busting my ass, busting my ass to pay for a house that I'm never in, I'm never in, I'm right, never right. in, you know. Yep. Um, and I took my daughter to see a movie. And there's a scene in the movie, you can look it up online. It's on YouTube. You just type in Rascal Flats. God Bless the Broken Road. Love that song. Acoustic. Ooh, I need to look that one up. Okay. I love acoustic music. Okay. Because it was a scene in the movie. <clears throat> what movie? Well, I'm going to get to it in okay. a second. Okay. You're going to be like, really? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, I'm, of course, we're watching it on the big screen. Yeah, of course. And it's one of them. I can't remember the style of the house. Um, but it had one of them wraparound porches. Okay. Um. And you had a couple of older people swinging on a swing on the front porch. 
Okay. Rascal Flats is like sitting on the front porch with acoustic guitars. There's other people on the porch, and they're just sitting on a beautiful summer night. Singing. Laughing and singing. And it's on a farm. Yeah, yeah. And I just sat there and watched this scene, and a tear comes down my eye, and I go, that's where I want to be. And it was the Hannah Montana movie. <laughs> oh, I've never seen that. So Miley yeah. Cyrus, Hannah yeah, Montana. Okay, okay. And it's funny, you know, it just, it hit me. I'm like, that's where I want to be. Hmm. I, I just, it just looks so beautiful. Oh, yeah, yeah, of course. And, uh, you know, I went home and I told my wife and she's like, you know, yeah, 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 Tennessee, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then, you know, I've always said it and she's heard me, yeah, hey, yo, Chris always wanted to go to Tennessee. <clears throat> and then Chris died. And Chris is your son. Yeah. Okay, just on me. And... You know, I, I, I made a deal with myself that I was going to work all my weddings. And I knew I had a break in November. And I said, let's get out of here. And then there was the debate of where you want to go. And my wife goes, why don't we just go to Tennessee? I know you always wanted to go there. Let's go. Now, normal people, <laughs> they will... Pretty much kind of make an itinerary and say, okay, so we'll fly out. I'll book the hotel for three days. We're going to go here this day, here we'll this day. We'll rent a car. We'll <clears throat> see this. We'll see this. We'll see this. Fly back home. Gotcha. No, what we did was we packed our bags. Literally just threw everything in a, in a like, throw your shit in a backpack. Yep. Um, or a gym bag, throw bag in back of car, drive to Tennessee. Huh. Awesome. Good for you. And it was, well, we've been on the road for seven hours. We're in West Virginia right now. Let's look for a place. Scroll, to... scroll the phone. Yeah. Here's a five-star Holiday Inn. Let's stay here. Do seven. you have a reservation? Do you, have, do you have room? Vacancy? Yeah. Booked it. Stayed. Next day we got up. Never had chicken and waffles, especially down in the south. <laughs> Let's go to a place that has chicken and waffles. Ate chicken and waffles. Okay, continue now. We're going to go to Gatlinburg and uh, Pigeon Forge. We pull into, like we're heading towards Pigeon Forge, um, and we pull into Seifertville, and my wife pulls into the strip mall because they have like a cast iron store. Oh, okay. And she's like, oh, I want to get a cast iron grill. And, and all right, well, you know, griddle. Yeah, yeah. Next to it was a gun shop. I got to go in there. And of course. <laughs> and it went in there. And next to it was a cowboy hat, cowboy boot, you know, type of place. I bought me a goddamn cowboy hat. And when I bought it, the girl gave me the hat in a bag and said, God bless you. And I'm not going religious on you. I'm just saying, yeah, just yeah. To God bless you. Sure, of course. And I was, I was actually taken aback by it. Like, I didn't sneeze. I mean, when you think, oh, <laughs> you know. And we go into Pigeon Forge, and they're decorating it, the whole town. Oh, for the holidays, huh? For Christmas. Yeah, yeah. Don't say holidays down there. They'll kick you. Oh, it's Christmas. Yeah. They're Merry decorating Christmas, it right? for Christmas. <laughs> okay. Say happy holidays. You get back. Right. No, you mean Christmas? Yeah, that's what I meant. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. And, I mean, gorgeous decor. Like, if if I was to pick a time to go to tennis, to Nashville, it'd be at Christmas time. Yes. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I would go. I would actually go to Pigeon Forge. Okay. And see that where the Smoky Mountains are? Yeah, yeah. Oh, and then you can go to the 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 whiskey distilleries and wow, that's, drink the moonshine it. and all of that stuff yeah, they have right. out there. And um, you know how when you go away to some place new, you have expectations, mm -hmm. even if it's a restaurant nearby. 
you might be like, oh, I heard, you know, this. Heard this. Somebody, somebody told me it was good. Somebody oh, told me you know, it was bad. Get this on the says menu. says it's good, right. you know. And then you go there and you're just, it doesn't hit your expectations. It doesn't meet your mark. Tennessee, that whole trip, exceeded my expectations. We well, didn't have any. Well, I did. From that from that Hannah Montana thing. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Okay. I had a I had a like, you know, why do I feel like I'm looking at home? You know what I'm right, saying? Right. And then when I went, I'm like, I I just you know I think your soul knows where it needs to be. <laughs> you it, know? Felt, it felt good down there for you. Huh? Yeah, man. And then we went to Nashville after that. Um, and some crazy stuff happened down in Nashville that you know blew my mind. And and then I get a phone call. Hey, can you come up to Knoxville? Yeah. Why? What's going on in Knoxville? Well, you're going to be a guest of the Tennessee Volunteers football team. How the hell are we doing a guest? Well, one of the coaches that coaches in Roxbury knows about your son. Knows about how they retired his number. Yeah, yeah. His football yeah. number and mm -hmm. um. You know, knows of the story, and Butch Jones, you know, heard about the story. Who's who at the time the coach of the Tennessee Volunteers? Okay, and he wants to welcome you as his guest. Ah, oh, damn! And when I tell you, people would kill for that honor, yeah, because yeah, they yeah. treat their college football team down there like we treat our Giants and Jets here. Yeah, I was going to say like the Cowboys it's down in Texas. Yeah, right? it's yeah. huge down there. Their college team, the the Volunteers team. Okay. So for me to walk in the locker room, there are people outside who would like kill you to get into that locker room. I was welcome into the locker room. I was welcome, you know. Yeah, yeah. And it was just an experience that I'll never forget. Now, how did you? So you were in Nashville. How did you get connected to go up there? I got a phone call. What do you? Are you still in Tennessee, Chris? Yeah. Oh, can, so some people yeah. knew you were there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can you get to, to Can you get to Knoxville connection. on Saturday? Yeah, we were supposed to stay here in Nashville till Saturday, but all right, I'll come down. Yeah. Um, Especially and, for something like that. And I was blown away. And then, you know, I believe that that's what America is, God's guts and guns, you know what I mean? <laughs> you know? And th that's how they made you feel, you know? It was a, a feeling. And last year... I went back, and uh, I went back to Nashville because I had an opportunity to play some music for a, uh, a music producer. Because at this stage of the game, I don't want to be the guy that in the front. I want to be the guy that writes the songs for the oh, guy okay. in front. Oh, okay. Yep. So that all they do is they make it a hit, and I sit home and collect the checks. Yeah, yeah. So that's like, you know, hopefully my next phase in life, <laughs> you know, um, in music life, you know. And... Uh, I went down there to talk to the producer, you know, but we made like a four or five day thing out of it. Okay. Yep. And I went with my friend Lori. And I said to my wife, I said, you know, I don't know if this trip is going to do anything Dang. of what the last trip did. Because oh. that was just, you know, you know, when you go back, it's like never this. Sure. Yeah. Even when you go see a movie again the second time, it just okay. doesn't have that. All right. Yeah, it's, I just, again, I, I just remember standing on a bridge in the middle of Nash, downtown Nashville, just taking a picture and just texting my wife going, I'm home. Uh, good for you, man. That's cool. I'm, I'm home. I just, I am. So um, my wife and I are going to fly out there again in, in January, and then I'm going to actually go record in that studio in February. Oh, how fun is that? Um, now, will that be your... Original music? Yeah. Oh, very nice. Yeah. That's cool. Uh, it'll be a song, one of the songs I wrote for Christopher. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, it's just going to make a great country tune, and maybe somebody will pick that sucker up and yeah, yeah. take yep. the ball and run with it, make it a hit, you know? Yep, yep, yep. Um, but it just, it, it's really a different slice of life down there than up here. I mean, you got you know the difference between here and Colorado has got to be well, de well, too. And we, my parents and my brother live up in northern Vermont. Like, they're like five miles from the Canadian border. Okay. And the difference between life here and there, I mean, it's a one eighty. Yeah. 
you know. But yeah, Nashville is something that you know. I remember go check that out. We're in Gatlinburg, and I ordered breakfast, and it's like about twenty five minutes, and I'm like, "Where the fuck are my eggs?" <laughs> I'm used to Jersey where wife, they're like, well, I, I just get done going over light and the fucking egg plate hits. Yeah, yeah. There, it's like, you know, we're taking our time here, son. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you yeah. Know? Total different pace of you ain't life. You from around here, are you, boy? You yeah, know, yeah. <laughs> it's... Food was good, though? <sighs> Funny story. In Nashville, we were staying at a, um, a hotel convention center called the Gaylord Opryland. Okay. And I took a picture of the lobby, like like the open space lobby. Mm -hmm. And a friend of mine, musician friend of mine, Jimmy, posts on my page underneath the picture. Is that Gaylord Opryland? Yes. Run. Don't walk. Run down to the restaurant in that picture uh, and have the shrimp and grits. No shit. Run. Don't I walk. I was like, is it really that good? He goes, yeah, you're not there yet? <laughs> Why are you talking to me? <laughs> and uh, we went, you know, I said, all right, here we go. You know, again, somebody recommends you to something. Yeah, and yeah. Expectations. Yeah. Tremendous. Oh, yeah. I'm not Absolutely. a grit guy, man. I can't. I don't either. I'm like, you know, what is a grit? You know what I mean? And it's yeah. like, and I'm like, okay, you know, but it was seasoned like what, like a, a, a spicy type of sauce and it had like, and do we sausage with two eggs on the top and shrimp around it? And, and uh, it was just. Hey, watch it. Hey, hey, Val. Yeah. What's a grit? It's, it's, it's corn. It's corn. Yeah. Yeah. What is it? Right? It's like mashed up corn. Yeah, mashed up corn. Yeah, but how's it? Co it's cooked different ways, right? It's like an oatmeal. Yeah, they dry it and then you reconstitute it with water. It's it's like a it's like a it's really like an I oatmeal. Think, I think I need to revisit it. See, this was with butter, and it was almost like a, um, a Frank's Red Hot in mm. in there with the yeah. shrimp, and it was like either cures or sausage, you know. See, all that with two good. eggs with two eggs over on top of it. Oh boy! <laughs> and then you cut it up, and then you mix it all together. Oh yeah, I was gonna say everything. And just it's mixed just together. a wonderful slop that you've ever had in your entire life. Oh. That's awesome. Oh, God. It was orgasmic. <laughs> um, there's other things that, like, you know, I remember I said a lot of crazy stuff happened down there. Um, when Chris passed away, there was, you know, I'm like, like, I'm not a spiritual man. Never was, you know. Okay. But enough weird shit happened to where I was like, do you win? <laughs> you yeah, know? There's something. Yeah, there's something. Right. Um, and in Tennessee, um, two stories. We're in Gatlinburg. My daughter decides, you know, like down the shore, they have those guys that draw your face like caricaturists. Oh, yeah, sure. Okay. We go down to shore all the time. My daughter doesn't want one of them damn things. In Tennessee, in Gatlinburg, she decides that she wants her face drawn. Oh, okay. When you go in, there's a big sign on the wall. No, I do not know where to get the best food. No, I do not know where... You cannot use my bathroom. No, you... So oh, yeah, yeah. People so, just yeah. stick their head in and they say to the guy, I ask him hey, questions. Hey, where's some good barbecue? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, whatever. And the guy's like, I'm running a business here, you yeah. know? Yeah. But when you become his client... He won't shut up. You can't shut that motherfucker up. Yeah, all right. And it was great. Yeah, I was going to say, that would be good conversation, right? Because he was telling me about tennis, like, that area. Yep. Here's And he would tell you, drive up here, go look at this, go make sure you explore that, um, what schools were like, what taxes were like, where you should live, where people, you know. Oh, he picked that up from you, huh? Oh, well, we were asking, you know, because yeah. as he was drawing, he was just flapping his gums, and we were asking questions. And when we left... My wife goes, he was so nice. And I said, well, you know what? I'm getting to firmly believe that you are where you're supposed to be. Yep. And that people are put in your life for a purpose. And I said, I think he was put in our life today to help us. Yep. Yeah, because she never wanted to be drawn before, but there yeah. you go. And now we cut to shrimp and grits. We're 
we we started a movement when my son passed away called Kindness for Christopher. Yep. And, and we wanted everybody to be kind on the 24th of every month. Um, we want everybody to be kind every day, but the 24th of every month to keep his legacy going. You know, now the 24th is he died June 24th, okay. 2015. So make instead of making it a somber day, here it is another month gone by, you know, no, we something. just said, do something kind for somebody in my son's name. Okay. It keeps his legacy alive. Um, so, you know, the kindness for Christopher thing was really starting to catch on. It was like three months in, you know, people behind the whole movement. It was becoming a thing. And there was a 20 year old waitress just finishing her shift. And we got her and she was a sweet kid and you know she was finishing her shift and we were still eating i said come sit down with us so my wife is talking to her you know we we're telling her about what happened with our son and kindness for christopher and this and that and you know we were really deep in the really deep in the throes of grief but we were really like pushing you know you are where you're supposed to be you'll get to where you want to go and you know yep and then when we left, my wife goes, so what do you, do you think she was putting our path for? I said, I think we were putting, she was putting our path to help, uh, for us to help her. Right, okay. And I let it go from there. Yep. That's what we were talking about overthinking, right? Yeah. And cut to two days later, on the Kindness for Christopher email message board, on the messenger, yep. is an email, a uh, private message. Not from the girl, but from the girl's mom who said, I don't know what you said to my daughter, but she's having a real tough time with this adulting thing. And you guys really pushed her in the right direction. You really touched her and she was oh, really moved awesome, by dude. what you had to say. And, you know, I said to her, I said, see? You know, and she's yep. like, wow. You were, you were there when you were supposed to be. And one night we left my daughter in the hotel and decided we're going to go for dinner. You stay here, you know, you live on your phone anyway. You ain't going to be, you know, missing us. <laughs> so we go for dinner and we're sitting in an outside veranda. Like, you know, just it's it's outside on the street in downtown Nashville. Okay. And I got like a little bit of like this fencing behind me and there's a street behind me that leads out to the main street. We're like in the corner. Okay. Okay. And over the little fence... A little boy jumps over the fence and goes, hi. And my what? wife goes, hi. And I scared the shit out of me because he came from behind me. I'm like, hi. He goes, can I show you my shirt? And I was like, yeah, all right. Show me your shirt. And it's Bob the Builder. And my son loved Bob the Builder. Now, remember, we're like four months removed from my son. And his mom comes up and goes, come on, we got to go. He goes, but wait, can I show him my shoes? He picks her up. Picks him up and puts him on the fence, like feet on the fence. Yeah. And his shoes are Lightning McQueen. And when his feet hit the fence, they're like light up shoes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And my son owned them and loved Lightning McQueen. And uh, she puts him down. And my wife goes, Wait, put him down. I want to give him something. And she walked up and she went to give him $5 because there was a candy store down the road. Okay. She goes, Go get yourself a candy. She says, What is your name? He said, Junior, my son's name was Christopher Patrick D'Amico Jr. And we were kind of like weirded out. And, you know, after a few more minutes of pleasantry, she said, come on, Junior, we got to go. And she picks him up and she's walking away. And as he's walking away, he turns around to the both of us and goes, Jesus loves you. Bye. Earlier in the afternoon, my wife... <laughs> was going through a tough moment and she just asked for a sign. And I turned to my wife and I said, so did you want the sign in neon or did you want it skywritten? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No doubt. And that crazy shit was happening. <clears throat> nonstop. All the time. But it was like on full blast in Tennessee. Um, you know, that's where I came up with good, bad, or indifferent. That's when, like, good, bad, or indifferent you are where you're supposed to be. Now, do you guys plan on moving down there i know eventually i'd like to okay. i mean my daughter still got a couple of years left in high school okay um you know i want to she's number one she gets her decisions get to factor in on where the hell we're gonna go yeah yeah of course but would i love to go there yeah i mean my wife probably wouldn't leave right away either i mean her parents are still here you know 
and uh, my wife's a good egg, you know. Yeah. Me, I don't give a shit. I'm out of here. <laughs> you know what I yeah, mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But no. that's, but that's how, yeah. like, that. you're kind of like me in that way. You know what I mean? Like, that free... That's Let's why go. that song "Free" hits you like the way oh, it does. Oh yeah, I love that. Song, you know, dude. it's yeah. um, Zach Brown is. Uh, I just saw him Friday night. Well, wow, where the hell were they? I was down in Florida visiting my brother. Oh, I was in the pit. I was as far away from him as I am from your wife right now. And he was amazing. Um, Did they do the big? Uh, uh, Mix at the end where they sing a bunch of different songs. Oh, like yeah, they did Sandman. Rage Against the Machine, and they did uh, Pour Some Sugar on Me. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Uh, he also pretty. did Use Somebody by Kings of Leon. He did... Holy cow. Yeah. And he puts it in like a big montage, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. You know who... Uh, one of my... Our first dates that we went on, I took my wife down to Atlantic City to see uh, Aaron Lewis. Okay. And um, he came out with his band... He played for about two hours, but he came out with his band and played like four or five songs with the band, and then they all left, and then it was him most of the time, or another guy would come out with another guitar for the rest of the time, but he would play like Cindy Lauper. Yeah, and go crazy, right isn't into, it? Go right into Enter Sandman, and like, not, and it worked, and I'm like, what? <laughs> Wait, I got one more, I got one more, holy shit, story to tell you about Tennessee. Okay. So like I said, that shit happened when we were there. Yep. Cut to three years later, last year when I went. Okay. And I was telling my wife, yeah, I'm home. This is this, this is it. This feels like it, you know? That night when we left John McBride's studio down there, my friend Lori, he gave my friend Lori third row seats to uh, Brett, Young. Brett Young. His song is In Case You Didn't Know. Oh, these. Yeah. I like that song. It's a great tune. Yeah. And we were so close to him, you could see him sweat. You know, we were in third row. We were so close to him, and I got a picture, and I'll show you later, that you could see the tattoo on his arm. Okay. And on his arm, it says, if it feels like home, follow the path. Fuck. <laughs> I you're can't like, make this shit up. You're like, yeah, all right. I, uh, I the, followed it. Here but, I am. but that's, you know, that type of shit has been happening all the time since Chris passed. It's crazy. Phew. You know, it's, uh, you know, it, it's, it, you got to be, you got to be awoke. And, you know, you know, I guess that's the term now. You got to be woke. woke. I still you know, don't get that. It, it, well, um, I listened to another podcast. So let me guess. Let me guess. You're about four to five years younger than me. Um, the reason why everything was so good in our 20s and teens is because we thought we knew everything and we didn't know shit. And then as you get older and the top comes off the lid of the box, Pandora. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You can't put it back on. No, right. Um, once you know, you know. Okay. Uh, uh, I see where that... Uh, okay. You, you know what I mean? And and now you're forever woke to that. So that's uh, where the woke thing comes uh, in? Yeah, I mean, they're, they're using it differently, but the whole thing is it's like, you want to call it perspective? You want to call it, you know, whatever you, you substitute your own term. Okay. All right. All right. But really, you're woke. You're woke, and okay. it's it's something, you know. It's a learned thing. Uh, I don't think I'd ever be this woke if Chris didn't pass away. Okay, I can see that. Um, I can see where that. But you know, I teach the ripple effect to people, to kids, and I'll be doing it. Um, I was going to say, I saw something on yeah. social media about that. I'll be doing a, and this isn't a shameless plug, but I'll be doing a, a thing in November um, where I'm going to be standing in front of the, you know, NJ DJN, uh, the New Jersey DJ. I was just going to say. Yeah. 
And um, that's not the one down in Atlantic City. No, they, this is uh, they meet once a month down in Addison. Okay. Um, and what I'll be doing is basically a bit a bit more adult version of what I'll be doing at the schools. I'm doing one at the schools tomorrow. I'm down in Hamilton tomorrow with the kids. Okay. But I teach the ripple effect. Um, Explain that. It, basically, what you're doing right now with this podcast, for instance, who the hell knows where it's going to go? Sure. Okay. You might not even see where it goes. You might not physically, you know, how do you know that somebody won't listen to this podcast right now? You'll never know it, but they'll listen to it on SoundCloud and maybe with some of the things that were, maybe it's another episode, not, not mine, but oh, that, yeah, we yeah. But what that, I'm saying from something. what you're doing and they hear something that makes sense to them and changes their life. You know, I tell a story about, um, you know, I get calls all the time. I want you to come and do my daughter's wedding. I saw you at this wedding. I saw you at that. Sure. Come, you know, it's referrals, right, you know. Right. Um, when you were doing photography and videography, somebody might have saw sat at somebody's house and saw the video. Yeah, saw the video. And, and they yeah. call up and they go, I want you to do my wedding. Absolutely. So, so I, get a, uh, I get an email. I need you at my daughter's wedding. I saw you at a wedding. You were, and I'm going to use their word, mesmerizing. And I'm like, wow. That's a nice compliment. I thought so. And I said, oh, you know, I we're going back and forth. I said, can you tell me who the, the client was? So maybe I'll match the version of the show that we did, you know, with personnel and, and stuff yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, And she said, um, you know, she gave me the name of the client, and I go look it up. And it, the date was July 31st, 2015. Now, it is a month and a week after R removed from Christopher, right? So some people will look at it at that. Yep, yep. I look at it as one of the, there was only two times after Christopher. I look at it as one of two times. If I had the strength to do it, yeah, I'd do it, and wouldn't be here anymore. Wow. It was at the lowest. Yeah, yeah. Of the low. And. All that that email showed me was that even at the lowest of my lows, even at the darkest point of my life at that moment, I was still bringing people into the light. There's your ripple effect. And that's the thing. And yeah. I had no idea I did that. Yeah, Because absolutely. that email didn't come till up to about two years after. Whew. You know, so you, you don't see. You know, and I use Chris... As a, an example, when sure. he was eight yeah, years old, when he was eight years old, he said to my wife and I, I don't want presents for my birthday. He said this to us. At eight? Yeah. I said, well, what the hell do you want? He goes, I want dog and cat food. I'm like, we don't have a dog or a cat. He's like, no, no. I want everybody to bring over dog and cat food because I want to donate it to a local shelter. God damn. Eight. Eight. That's why and you didn't, and like... We you had nothing to do with nothing that. Nothing to do with it. We got two truckloads. <laughs> Save man if you're going to do it, right? Well, I mean, you know, it was one of those things where once everybody heard what... Oh, I see what you're saying. He, we, yeah. I live in tiny town where if you don't know what you're doing, somebody else usually does. <laughs> um, so the word got around that that's what he wanted. And everybody thought that that was just the coolest fucking thing. Anyway. So they gave him a gift anyway, and they brought dog and cat food. Oh, okay. Yeah. You know, and we got two truckloads. And we brought him to the animal shelter. Okay. Eight years old. Awesome. Now you think about it, that's the splash. You know, when you think of ripples. Okay. You take a, a rock, yep. and you throw it in the lake, and it makes a splash. And you go, oh, cool, look at the splash. Isn't that cool? Yep. And you don't notice that the ripples are, you know, all around that splash. Um, the splash was, here's all this dog and cat food I'm dropping off at a shelter. Now, here are the ripples that you don't see. Let's just say they have 50 dogs and cats on a shelf that were scheduled to be put down. Because they couldn't that afford to feed, feed them. them. Yep. Now, we can feed them. And now, because we can feed them, 50 families come in and adopt these 50 pets. 
and look at the and the effects that, pet, that the pet makes on that family. Yeah, absolutely. We don't know, right? So that's Phew. you know I try to teach people that you know we are energy, we are power, you know, and you know I teach people we're superheroes, you know. Everybody's a superhero. Everybody's well, a superhero. My well, what's a superhero? A superhero is somebody, by, by definition, wants to change the world we live in and help people. Whatever that means. Okay? To, to that superhero. Well, everybody's that at a point. Well. At a degree. You would, you would like to think. Wow. But, um, you know, there's also villains. <laughs> you well, know. you got to have, well, have a balance, well, right? Yes, the yin and the yang. Yep, yep. But the thing is, is, you know, that's what a superhero does. And if you look at most origin stories of superheroes, they usually okay. don't know that they're superheroes. Until something. Somebody's got to show them their power, teach them they have a power. I mean, for Christ's sakes, one of the biggest lines in a superhero movie is, with great power comes great responsibility. responsibility. Yeah. I mean, even Superman didn't know what the hell was going on with him until he got high in, up in well, the mountains with the Fortress of Solitude and, and the, a, a little crystal went in and Jor-El came up and said, this is what's up with you. Yeah, yeah, that's what's going <laughs> yeah, on. All right. Well, the, the example that came to my mind was uh, Iron Man, the yeah. Tony Stark thing, mm -hmm. you know? And you don't know the power that you have. You know, I tell, I tell a story about uh, these two kids in high school. I don't tell it to the little kids. I tell it to the adults, <laughs> okay? These two kids in high school. Um, one kid took all the books out of his locker, cleaned out his entire locker, was carrying them. And a couple of kids walked by and knocked him out of his fucking hand. And the kid just, you know, sighed and started picking him up. And along comes this other kid and helps him pick him up and actually carries half of him. He goes, Jesus, what are you cleaning out your locker for? He goes, fucking, you going to carry these all the way home? He goes, yeah. This kid goes, I'll help you. And he takes him home with him. And that day started a friendship. Yeah. And that friendship lasted, you know, it was strong friendship through the rest of high school, through college, through marriages, through kids, they get to each other's 50th birthdays. And uh it's the one kid that helped the other kid's 50th birthday. Okay. And his best friend for 40, 30, 40 years was asked to make a speech for his best friend. And he stands up and he goes, talks about how nice this kid is. And the ends it, he goes, now here's something that you don't know. The day you came to see me cleaning out my locker, I was actually leaving school to go home and kill myself. And if you didn't come over and help, and, him and help me carry the thing home thing. and become my best friend from that day forward, wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be here today. Yeah. Yeah. Ah. And that's, you know, if you were to ask me the question that wasn't asked about career, where do I see myself going next? Well, if I can write songs for other people. Well, I was going to say you answered that, yeah. And teach people about this ripple superpower. Effect. Oh, okay. You know, yeah. ripple effect and, and how yeah. the, you know, the ripple effect of, of their superpower. Yeah, yeah. I mean, look, let's go all the way back to when I was in elementary school. Look, man, what, like 6'1", 240 pounds, okay? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I was about this big in the fourth grade. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know how that feels, yeah. Okay. Yep, yep. And I got picked on just as big because <laughs> I was the big lumbering idiot, yep, yep. you know, the gentle giant in the fourth grade. I wouldn't punch you in the mouth. I'd just, you know, take it. Yeah. And, you know, what I try to teach the kids is, you're a superhero. You have superpowers, and your superpower is kindness. However, there's a villain. The villain is a bully. And the bully has powers of their own. The first power is they're able to turn people into bullies just like them. Okay. I'll get into that yeah, in a second. Yeah, yeah. You know, the face that may say, you know, I'll help you with that in a minute. <laughs> and the other thing, their other power is the ability to take away your shine. Oh, that's a big one. Okay. 
I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to use your wife as an example right now. Okay. If I started making fun of your wife, you have a choice. You could either tell me to stop or you can make fun of her with me. Yeah. Yeah. And if you make fun of her with me, I've now turned you into a bully. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, okay. My first reaction was that would not turn out well for you. No, it's not, <laughs> that's because I expected as much. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. No, I get it. Okay. I get it. So the ability to take away your shine. Well, what's your shine? Well, when you're a kid, you might be good at video games. You might be good at soccer. Drawn. Drawn. Whatever. Um, but if you draw a nice picture and somebody comes up to you and goes, That's ugly. You fucking, that, it looks like shit. Whew, gone. Shine. And then you, you stop drawing. Mm. Okay. You know how many people made fun of me because of singing? I was the big kid in the fourth grade who sing. sang. Yeah, yeah. Okay. In the fifth grade, I got up on stage at like the a, talent show. I was going to say a talent show. And I sang the best of times by sticks. You made fun of by myself. What do they call that? Uh, no, no, no. I didn't do acapella. acapella. I had the record playing behind me, a low. Oh, okay. But you know, it was before karaoke. You know, you had the actual <laughs> record on a forty-five playing on it. You know, and they never made fun of me again. And because you know what, it took balls. Get up there and do that. But what if I listen to the naysayers? Would I have D'Amico Entertainment? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Would yeah. I have played and made albums? Would I be going to Tennessee to record in a big studio? Yep, yep. Family. Because some, some little fuck in the friggin' fourth grade told me that I can't sing? And, and You fat bastard, why are you singing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You he's sing like a girl? A, he's probably sitting on a bar stool at 4 o'clock on a Wednesday. You know, and I mean, that's the funny thing, too. It's like these are the people that peaked in high school, yeah, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Like, you know, fucking Al Bundy, three touchdowns, one game, you know what I mean? <laughs> you know? And living off of it still in his 50s, you yeah, know? Yeah, but, yeah. But you don't see that. I had a... I had a, a great example of the ripple effect. Uh, you know, I spend time in the gym. Sure. And I'm just going through my stuff. You know, I put headphones on and I just put my head down and I get in there, tear it up, you know, do my thing. Amen. And uh, this guy come over to me and he didn't interrupt me, but he was kind of hovering a little bit. Right? So, I, you know, I acknowledged him. And, it's all right, Creeper. <laughs> yeah. I acknowledged him, and uh, he said, I just, just real quick, I wanted to thank you. And I said, sure. Well, I was like, for what? And he goes, you're the reason I'm here today. And I go, uh, okay. Uh, you know, I'm like my face, you know, I'm like looking at him like, what the fuck? You know, I'm and married, he, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And he goes, uh, I was there. I was at my house, in my hallway, with my gym clothes on, but I only had 45 minutes of time. And he goes, what would that big guy at the gym say if I, if I was standing here? And I kind of look at him, I go, go to the fucking gym, dude. He goes, exactly, that's why I'm here. And I go, awesome. You know, it made me feel good, right? And I go, well, and find, you know, his name's Al. And I slap him on the shoulder, I go, Love that you love that you came up and told me that. No, you only got forty five minutes, so I'm gonna leave you alone. And I turned and walked away. Now I see him all the time and he fist bumps me and yeah. you know, hollers at me from across the gym and stuff. But that's I'd assume I mean that there's you a go, effect. You wanna go further? Well, I I had no idea what I was what effect I had on that. But you wanna go even further with this? Well, real quick, I yeah. came home and I told my wife and I'm like, Oh my god, that made me feel great. And she's like, Oh, absolutely, that's great. And she goes, but imagine the people that don't say anything to you that you affect. Exactly. Right? So I, that situation came to my mind when you were talking about the ripple effect. But let's go further with your buddy Al. How do you know that he wasn't pre-diabetic? And because, you know, the hardest thing to do is take the first step. Oh, of When course. it comes to the gym and shit. Yeah. So the hardest thing to do all that, is, right? you know... Because there's a level of accountability you have to have for yourself. 
that's why some people get trainers because they know, look, I ever made the appointment with the trainer. I can't not show right, right. up. Sure. Okay. Sure. And it's cool that they recognize that and make that step to get a trainer. Now it's funny we're talking about this because I just, you know, I'm, I'm one of those people. I just lost 50 pounds. Yeah, I was going to say. Okay. And it's one of those things where, you know, I, re I was diabetic. I reversed it by oh, losing wow. this 50 pounds. Diet, my my diet? A1C was nine. What's that? So explain that, though. Some um, people... a, A1C, the proper range in your blood, A1C, should be between five or 4.9 and 5.5. Right. When you get past six, you're kind of pre-diabetic. Okay. When you get past seven, yeah, you are. Yeah. You know, okay. mine was nine in April. Now, is that uh, all those years of wedding food and not taking care of yourself and that kind of thing? Pretty much. Okay. okay. So I cut back bread, pasta, rice, potatoes, you know, and I Sugar. started yep, yeah. and I started working, 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 working. And I got my blood done in July. This just passed. Yeah. On. Okay. And my A1C was five point five. Whoop whoop. And the endocrinologist goes, What in the fuck are you doing? Did you take it? That's what I'm not doing. Well he goes, Are you taking <laughs> the metformin? Because they wanted to put me on this drug called metformin. Yeah. Um, which is your typical you know, type two diabetes. And that's a drug. slippery slope, right? And he goes, Are "You taking the metformin?" I said, "No, the George Foreman. I'm doing a grill. I'm, ah. I'm like, you know, cooking and eating yeah, and doing yeah. things right." And, um, you know, knock on wood, I'm six months in. I've kept my shit in check. Good for you, man. Congratulations. But back to your guy Al. How do you know he's not where I was? You know, and and it's tough for it was tough for me to get up. The first thing I said in, in happened on April. This April fool found out he had a problem on April first, <laughs> and I said from that day I'm going to move. The first thing I'm going to do is seven days a week. I'm going to move at least a half an hour a day. So even if that means walk the park, or yeah, ride yeah. a bike, walk sure. a treadmill, um, ride the elliptical, motion something for a half an hour a day, at least. And then I signed up with a trainer in May. And then I went, and then I was doing kickboxing too with CKO. Oh, good for you. And that's good. Oh, oh yeah. my God. Those girls kick my ass. <laughs> um, you usually pay extra oh, for that, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Beat the crap out of me. Oh, but I love it. Love yeah. every minute of it. It's a work. You lose a thousand calories. Yeah. Burn it in an hour. I, uh, I have a meme that I post and I, I, once in a while when I feel like it, right? I have this one. And I went to the gym this morning, and I struggle a little bit to get to the gym, you know, 5 o'clock in the morning. Amen. And I posted it on the way out, and it says, fuck, I wish I didn't do that. You never hear when somebody leaves the gym. I like that. You never hear anybody when they leave I'm the gym that. go, oh, absolutely, take I'm it. stealing that. I don't know if you saw my post the other day. I said, well, I finally got eight hours. I checked in at the Y. Okay. Because I go to the I go to the you know the Y to where my trainer is. And oh, okay. So I checked in there, and I said, "Well, I finally got eight hours of sleep. Whether the fact it was over five days is irrelevant." <laughs> I said, "I really, really do not feel like working out right now, but here I am, Becky. Here uh, I am." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Monday but you felt great leaving, right? Monday I did not want to work. I didn't feel good. I didn't feel good Monday afternoon. Yeah. It's, it's a combination of the weather and the this and the that. And, um, and when I left the gym, Great. I'm like, I needed that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I needed that. that. And then I, uh, working out one day, I just, it popped in my mind that I gave everything I could in my workout. Right. And I, I literally had nothing left. I'm like, Sitting on my knees, just fucking. I know, I know just, those workouts. Yeah, I resemble that remark. And uh, yeah, and I, uh, but I left with everything. You know, it just—it's amazing. It's people underestimate. My wife loves working out. I can't and not now. I love working out. I can't not now. And the thing is, with this guy, I was telling you back to this guy Al. You might have saved his life. Maybe I don't you know. don't. But you don't. But this is what I mean by the ripple effect. You yeah, just yeah. don't know because they keep going on. And on. And he might have done on, something to in somebody on. else because of... Yeah, and, you know, he might have told the story about you to someone yeah. else. 
and inspired them. Yeah, I yeah. mean, and, and that's just one person. You know, your wife is right. Now, how many people don't you know? Yeah, they do it without. And it's like I saw, uh, I love memes. And oh, the reason yeah, me I love too. memes is they portray an incredible amount of information really quick. Right? And one was... Uh, Never heard it explained like that, but I like that. That's true. <laughs> it's absolute truth. Uh, God, I'm going to butcher it, but you get the point is keep doing what you're doing because you never know who you're inspiring. That's kind of like... That with the ripple effect. Kind of like what I'm trying to teach people too, but, but it's, it's even more than that because sometimes it's a smile. Oh, just be you, nice it, to people. Just, just, just be nice to people. Just, you know... <laughs> Be kind. Yeah. Um, you could be having the most horrible day in the world, and somebody comes up to you and goes, man, you look great. Boom. That's it. And, that, and that moment, thank you. I really needed that. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, it, it's funny. I, I did it yesterday because I posted a story. Um, a potential client asked me, why do I charge as much as I charge? I saw that. Yeah. And I tell the story about how this guy had a ship yeah. and the engine died on the ship and he tried everything to get it going again and he couldn't. And uh, he hires this old mechanic and he comes in and he's got this little tiny hammer and he looks at this big engine and he just looks at this one spot and he gives it a little tap and the engine just goes. And he goes, I'll bill you tomorrow. <laughs> and the guy was blown away when the bill came in for ten grand. And he goes, Ten grand? You just tapped the engine with a little hammer. He says, Well, let me break it down for you. Tapping the engine with the hammer, two dollars. Knowing no where worried. to tap, yeah. nine thousand nine hundred and ninety eight <laughs> bucks. Know what you're worth and go and get it. Yeah. And somebody wrote underneath it, I needed this today. Yeah. So well, even it's something I, to where I was trying to make people just laugh. Yeah, but you never know what language is going to, people are going to accept that, you know, that language spoke to him. If you put it in there, know what you're worth, that might have not spoke to him. But if the whole story spoke to him in the way it should have. Well, I teach people too about, um, you know, how one action leads to another. And, you know, I have a rock with me when I do these things because we had the kindness for Christopher thing. Somebody put a rock that said, leave footprints of love and kindness and rocks. Hashtag kindness for Christopher. Okay. Behind it in front of my fire department. Okay. Long story short, somebody did it. I don't know who it is. To this day, I still don't know who it is. That's a great thing, though. Okay. Fire, fire chief calls me, tells me, somebody just left this thing, this rock in front of my place. Let's start it with that rock. Then one was found in front of the police department. One was found in front of the uh, quick check in my town. One was found in front of the school. It just started putting one was found, huh? and the next thing you know, one is found in Louisiana. One is found in Alabama. One is found in uh, Hawaii. Um, one is painting seashells and putting them on the until finally one was found in Hungary, and a, a soldier was holding one in Kuwait. And how cool is Until that? finally, one was found on the Great Wall of China. And it started with one rock in front of a fire department in a little one-horse town in New Jersey. Yeah, but you could use a metaphor and say, hey, you look great today. That's it. One yeah. thing. Now it travels. It travels. But yeah. the thing here with the rocks is I bring this rock with me. Yeah. And I tell people, I said, what if I walked up to this guy and just went, boom, and threw the rock at him <laughs> and hit him in the face? And they're like, oh, you know, the kids usually, oh, you know, and I go, and now if I said sorry, does that make a difference? No, no, I said no. the face is still all busted yeah, yeah, up. Yeah, yeah. I said, all right, now substitute this rock with a word from your mouth. It hits uh, just as hard as a rock does. Well done, well done. Except yeah. it doesn't you know, leave the marks exterior. It leaves the marks interior. interior. Yeah. So everything that you say, you're held accountable for. And then I tell kids too, I go, listen. And on social media. Not just for yeah. Well, yeah. well, I tell people the story of uh, that when they put it out there in social media, it's out there for good. Yeah. I tell the picture, uh, the story about the um, the Brewers pitcher. I don't know that story. Two years ago, uh, one of the Brewers relievers, I can't remember his name, twenty four years old, got asked to pitch 
in the All-Star game. Okay. Now imagine being this kid. He's 24 years old, and he's getting on the mound in an All-Star game. And somebody brings up racist tweets that he wrote when he was 17. Ugh. Now, you wow. know as well as I do, that kid is, he, the kid's a different human being from 17 to 24. Right. Okay. But we don't look at it that way. Society but doesn't look at it that way. It's out there. Yeah, yeah. And it's still out there. Yeah. Okay. You know, and that's what I teach about the social media thing. Permanent. Once it's out there, if you could delete it, if somebody screenshot it, it's still out okay. there. Yeah. That whole Snapchat where it goes away. People, first thing they do is screenshot it. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, listen, I have people with anonymous apps. Like my daughter's got this stupid anonymous app on her phone. An anonymous app is where people can say whatever they want to say about you and you won't know who the hell it is. Oh, that's, yeah. So no somebody said that. you just want attention because your brother died. No reason for that. Um, and I said to my daughter, I said, you're just opening up this damn can of worms for yourself. But then again, no one should be writing that type of shit either. Yeah, yeah. You know, it, it's just... So what I tell people, too, is I also use the rock, and I say, this rock is the most precious rock in the world. There is no rock like it any place else in the world. If this rock gets broken and destroyed, there will be no other rocks like this one or after it, and I'm going to give it to you. You know, I'm handing it to, like, a, an eight-year-old kid, and the yeah, kid's, yeah. like, trembling Whoa. in his boots when I'm handing this rock. Yeah. So I hand him the rock or her the rock, and I take the rock back. And I said, now, I want now how you do you to, feel? I said, well, now I want you to take a look at everybody around you. And everybody starts looking around you. I said, you are all precious and unique. And if you're destroyed, there ain't another one like ah. you. I said, That's why would you good. treat yourselves around you any differently than you would me handing you a stupid rock? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good for you, dude. Now, how did you start that? Like, how did you get hooked up with the kids doing that? Honestly? My wife and I have been trying to remember, and we can't. It just happened, and you don't know how it... It okay. happened, and it just went from there. Okay, all right. And the thing Maybe is... it's a good thing. It's... I have a friend of mine who's a, uh, a DJ, and she's out in Connecticut. Okay. And she's really good with the YouTube thing. She's like doing on YouTube what you're doing here with the podcast. Okay. She gets on there, and she talks about gear... Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Oh, God, um, I imagine. Yeah. Scenarios. Sure. You know, I, I'm using... Teaching people. Well, yeah, I'm using, a, you know, Ape Labs lights, and I'm using this, and look at the effect that it has on the room. And then you if know, you want this effect, you can right, change it this you know, way. And, and this yada, is my yada, yada, new yada. table. And yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a good way for her to get sponsorships, but it's also, right. you know... Sure. But she's She's doing, passionate about it. She's she passionate. She's, she's very informative. Um... I'm not gonna lie. She's easy on the eyes. She's a kid, you know. But yeah. she's but she's doing, and she's become well known in for the it. DJ community for it. Good for her. It's a lot of work. And I pulled her aside at the DJ convention. I was introduced to her in Vegas last March, and in August, I pulled her aside of this year at the DJ convention in Atlantic City, and I said to her, "I'll go." I said, "Okay." I said, everybody wants a piece of you now because of what you've done. Yeah. Bravo. I said, now you are a voice. Okay. The good thing about it is you're doing very positive stuff for our community. The bad thing is, is everybody wants to touch you. And they, you know, people will try to be a part of you for nefarious reasons. Yeah, sure, sure. The best advice that I can give you is as follows. Wherever you go from here, make sure it's true to who you are and in, it's organic. Because the other thing that, you know, I was woke about with the Christopher thing and this kindness for Christopher thing and me doing all these speaking about ripple effect and everything is how organic it was. Remember we talk about don't force anything? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Everything that we've been doing, like how do we end up in the schools? We just ended up there. It just was it's organic, organic yeah. and it just sure. ended up there. Um, how did you end up speaking? It just it's organic because that's the stuff that works best. Yep. Um, you know, when people try to latch on, I told her, 
which evidently is going to happen the more of a bigger voice that you get. I said, you know, just remember to stay true to yourself. If it doesn't feel right in your heart, get out. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Get out because it's not right. Yeah. How's Go she with doing? Your gut. How's she's she great. doing now? She's still going. You know, she tried. Um, I think her regular straight job is um, like uh, like a paramedic or teaching. Um, like CPR or something? Well, or? that and uh, self-defense. And, and Oh, wow. Okay. Okay. So she tried to expand her thing by saying, you know, how to, what happens if something happens at a wedding? Because there was a story about a guy who walked into a church and just opened fire on a bride and a groom. And a, oh, and, okay, and, sure. And she tried to, you know, educate her on, on what she knows. Yeah, yeah. And Didn't go over well? Well, she said, I'm going to get some backlash. I said, of course you are. I said, do you feel good speaking your truth? She goes, yeah, I go, do Fuck it anyway. It. Yeah, yeah. I absolutely. said, you're always going to get some backlash. Yeah. There's oh, and, and it's usually jealousy. Yeah, it's somebody, because nobody can. Somebody's doing better than you is not talking shit about you. No, you know they're they're proud of you. Yeah. I I'm damn proud of that kid because you know what? She is a woman's voice in a, in a predominantly male I was industry. Say, very dominated, dominated. And male industry. that alone, I told her, earned you like serious points. Yeah, yeah. Good for I her. said, now that you've turned everybody's head, you know, just stay. It could be very easy. Oh. Yeah, turn it. Yeah. it did, go in to, a different direction. To have we'll somebody, or, or, or like, you know, you start hearing the outside voices telling you should do this and you should do that and you should yeah, do this. Yeah. Just stay true to you because it's gotten you this far. Yeah, I got. Yeah, that's a good way. What got you here? You know, yeah. stay true to you because it's gotten you this far. It'll yeah. only get you further. Yeah. Ah, good for her. Yeah, I mean, but, that's the tough type of stuff. You know, I'm trying to teach. You know, it, and and what did I just say in long form and short form? With great power comes great responsibility. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, my my theory or my saying on that: doing the right thing is fucking doing the right thing. That's it. A friend of mine, who um, we've become rather estranged, but he always said to me, he goes, if you're on the side of right, you have nothing to worry about. Sleep good at night. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. You know, and that always, that always resonated with me. If you fly a right ship, if you know you're trying to do, you know, be a good shit and you're not trying to hurt anybody... You're taking care of your business. You're taking care of your family. You're taking care of your friends. You know, you're honest. You have integrity. You do what you mean what you say and say what you mean. And, Things will you know, even if you're not a millionaire, you're, you're still, rich. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, with that, dude, we've been at this for a while. Have we really? Yeah. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, thanks, dude. No, thank you. Thank you for having me. I do. I do. I would like you to sing, though. You mind, <laughs> you mind singing something? You don't have to. I don't want pressure. Oh, you know what it is? It it's actually kind of funny because like when we do sound check, they say, "All right, Chris, you know, get on the mic and do a sound check." And how many songs do you think I know in my head? None. Oh, bajillion. <laughs> but I can never pick Remember. one. Yeah, yeah. To do a sound, I I start going. No, not that one. Um, oh yeah, you're. Uh, 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 no, uh, not that one. What about the one uh, you're? With Christopher. Just a couple uh, lines. No matter where you are, my love will find you. All the miles between us, my love will find you. Even if you've gone to a place that's just beyond the stars, just look behind you. My love will find you, no matter where you are. Woo! <laughs> I got goosebumps, dude. <laughs> I, got a, I got a plus from your wife. <laughs> that was awesome. I do it for the ladies. You have to oh, well, yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, dude. It was an uh, awesome again. pleasure. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening. As you can see, we always have a good time here. And keep the ripple infect in mind uh, as you go about your daily business. You can see Chris's website in the show notes. 
And speaking of websites, I have my new website up, waltzkitchentable.com. I built it myself. You can uh, see all the shenanigans going on, uh, catch up on other episodes, and of course, contact me if you want to come on, because you might not think it, but you have something to talk about. And of course, Instagram, WKT Podcast, and Waltz Kitchen Table on Facebook. Thanks again, everybody. Much love.